so brothers and sisters, we are going to be looking through the course of today at uh, three occasions that we have in the gospel records where three men are selected by the Lord Jesus to witness his majesty. Um, that's how Peter describes it, isn't it, in, uh, in his second letter. And uh, as we go through these sessions, uh, I've no idea whether... Um, whether Johnny's going to be in questions, but I certainly in this first one, I want you to ask a couple of questions as we go through, which are, um, first of all, what is it that we see in the incident that we're reading about? In what way is the majesty of Jesus revealed to us? Um, and secondly, uh, perhaps the, the enigmatic question, why were these three men in particular chosen to witness these events? Okay, keep those questions in your mind as, as we go through just coming to the the first of those you know in, in what way is is the majesty of, of Jesus revealed you remember and uh, brother Richard said this in his prayer at the beginning that Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 that it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ so, so the glory of God is, is something that you and I see in, in the face of Jesus Christ. And we we might expect, mightn't we, that, that what uh, Paul is talking about there is, is, is the majesty of Jesus being some kind of visible glory that we, in looking at Jesus, you could see the, the brightness of the glory of God revealed. And of course, to a degree, um, that's, that's what we're going to see happening in the, the transfiguration of Jesus. But there are other times uh, all the way through the Gospels where the glory of God and, and that reflected majesty in the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be shown to us in far less overwhelming ways. Uh, and yet, though less overwhelming than, say, the Transfiguration, there are ways which are just as powerful when, when we read about them. So for just a, a, as an example, then. Um, think of when, when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus and, and there was an objection made to him opening the tomb. And, and this is what John records. Jesus says to her, to Martha, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And, and what was it that Martha then saw on that occasion? Well, she saw the glory of God displayed when the tomb was opened and Jesus spoke no more than three words, Lazarus, come forth. And, and people, all those that were standing there on that day, saw the glory of God reflected the, in Jesus, the majesty of Jesus then, as, as the son of God, whose voice alone was enough to raise the dead back to life again. Now, the, the resurrection of Lazarus, where Jesus quite clearly says this is the glory of God being revealed. That's not the first time. Is it? It's not the first occasion where we see Jesus revealing his glory in that way, uh, raising the dead back to life. And so we're going to look now at one of the earlier occasions in the gospel records where that happens. And it's and it's the first time when Jesus actually picks out three of his apostles, Peter, James and John, to witness these events taking place. So hopefully you've still got your your, uh, your Bibles open at Mark chapter 5. And uh, what one of the things that we can't escape when we're reading through the gospel records is that this particular bit of narrative uh, brings together two events. All, all three of the gospel writers who record the incident with Jairus' daughter bring two events together. And, and so we, we're going to have to look at the two together because they're, they're intended to be seen as one story with, with, a, with a message which uh, is there for us overlapping. So let's, uh, let's pick it up then at uh, verse 21, where we read that when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea. So here he is back in, in Capernaum again, and Jesus is back in teaching mode once more, uh, very much delivering the, the good news, the, his message of salvation, uh, the, the message of the kingdom of God to those people who would listen to him, uh, an eager crowd who've gathered around him and are thronging him. 
And it's at that point, of course, that verse 22 records, and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. <clears throat> and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. It's interesting, you know, that all three gospel writers start by saying, behold, which is a, which is a word of surprise, as, as, if, as if there was some surprise there that one of the rulers of the synagogue had, had come and approached Jesus uh, on this occasion. Now, in some ways, actually, it shouldn't really be that big a surprise, should it, that Jairus would, would come to Jesus. After all, it was in the synagogue at Capernaum, with Jairus presumably sitting there, where Jesus has already done many miracles in the past. In, in fact, Jairus may have been one of those who approached Jesus on behalf of the centurion, uh, whose servant was ill. Remember, the centurion sent elders of the Jews to Jesus, pleading him to come and heal his servant. And it was those elders who said, uh, at the end of that quote there, this, this one is deserving for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue, uh, Jairus's synagogue there in Capernaum. So, uh, so no surprise really that Jairus would come to Jesus. Maybe to the, the behold is about the manner in which he comes. Because what did it say there at the end of verse 22? And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. And there's the surprise, brothers and sisters, that from a man of this standing in his community to, to come and kneel and, and fall on his face in front of the, the carpenter from Nazareth and in front of all that crowd of, of common people, well, that, that was a surprise indeed. It's a testimony, isn't it, to the, the desperate need which Jairus felt, because of course, brothers and sisters, desperate need sweeps away all human pride, doesn't it? Just as it should do for you and me. You know, when we come to the Lord Jesus and we seek the forgiveness which he has purchased for us, then there's no room for pride, is there? That there's only room for us falling on our face and pleading for what we need. So again, verse 23, Look at how, how serious the situation is. He begged him earnestly, saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. In, in fact, Matthew actually has it put even stronger than that. Look at Matthew 9's uh, account. Um, he said, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Now, we know from the three records that she hadn't died at this point. I think the I think the idea that Matthew is conveying there is, is that Jairus is saying to Jesus, we, we actually thought she died only a minute ago. It, it's it, she's that close to death. She's right on the edge of of dying. But you can lay your hand on her and she will live. And it's clear, isn't it, from what the Gospels say of, of Jairus comments that Jairus absolutely believed that Jesus could make his daughter better, that he could save her. Um, he had been convinced by, by all the other things that he'd seen Jesus do there in, in Capernaum, in his own synagogue and in the town. Not only did he believe that Jesus could do this, but he also believed that Jesus would, would leave the crowd and, and would come to help him. That's interesting, isn't it, when, when you think about it? Because there's Jesus standing on the seashore. He's got this huge crowd around him. Jesus is teaching this, this great multitude. He's giving to them a message which will save them. And yet Jesus leaves the many for the sake of one. And, and that one is only a child. And without doubt, I, I think uh, any of us looking at that event would say that Jesus did absolutely the right thing. You, you know, there's, there's really a reminder to us, isn't there, in, in what Jesus does here, that the most important things that you and I do in our life in Christ are not the big broadcast things that, that, that we might do, not the things that we might do for the many, 
Uh, I feel rather ironic in saying that since I'm speaking to you all now. Um, but, but, you know, the, the important things that we do, the ones that really stand out, that have the most impact are the actions that we do to help or even to save individual men and women. Uh, even as uh, even when, as is the case here on this occasion, even even if there's hardly anybody that ever ever knows what we've done or sees it, it's the individual things we do on a personal level that actually are the more important. You know, it's 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 that kind of individual and, and priceless work that uh, that that James had in mind. Just a couple of days ago, we we read in at the end of his letter this comment. He says, "Brethren, if anyone among you." wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And I wonder, brothers and sisters, whether when James wrote those words, whether he was thinking back to that day when a single soul was saved from death. And, and James takes the lesson from that occasion that he witnessed and he applies it now to our behaviour towards one another about how we can save a single soul from death in the way that he'd seen his master do it. So there's a lesson for us in perspective, brothers and sisters, never to never to think that the things that we do for the many are, are more important than than the individual action we might do for one person uh, in our ecclesias. Of course, it's at this point then, uh, as Jesus heads towards Jairus' house, that his journey is derailed, uh, not just by the crowd, of course, who thronged him and slowed him down on the way, uh, but by the incident that now comes up with the woman. As verse 24 goes on to say, so Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and immediately brought to our attention then is this link between the two women the woman who has a flow of blood for 12 years and and it's Luke who records to us that Jairus had an only daughter about 12 years of age and she was dying now you, you can understand can't you brothers and sisters why why some commentators have suggested that actually this woman may have been none other than than the girl's mother uh, that she'd suffered postnatal bleeding which had never stopped well uh, it, it's it's a, a possibility but i i suspect that the circumstances of what's going on here um, and the way it's recorded make it make it unlikely that that's actually the case but there is most definitely a link that you and I are supposed to see, brothers and sisters, in, in the way this record is given to us across the Gospels, that this woman has been ill as long as that little girl has been alive. And I just want you to uh, just keep that in mind as we go through, please. So let's carry on. What what do we know of this woman? A flow of blood for 12 years, verse 26, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And the emphasis which Mark gives us in that verse really is, is all about the, the uselessness of human effort, isn't it? Here was this poor woman who had tried every available human solution to her illness. And yet after every single method she tried, the, the result she, she came up with wasn't even that she'd stood still. But actually, as Mark says, she grew worse. Interesting, isn't it? That's the point that Luke doesn't make. He said she'd spent her money on physicians, but as a physician himself, he doesn't point out the fact that uh, the physicians had made her worse. But here's this poor woman who, whose every expectation, every, every cure she'd looked to had only disappointed her. And in the end, she was reduced to absolute poverty. And it seems to me, brothers and sisters, that when we look at this woman uh, and we look at her as, as I look at all the, the healings that Jesus does, we look at her as a kind of parable. Then we see her as symbolic of, of the Gentiles at the time when the Lord Jesus came, 
it, here were here were men and women who were unclean people who were impure who were who were so sick through sin here were gentiles who had spent hundreds of years seeking every bit of help they could find from from human philosophy and, and from all the different idols which they had worshipped Th those were the physicians which the the gentiles sought after and yet every one of those solutions they sought to their mortality and, and their sickness just made them worse that they were spiritually bankrupt weren't they the gentiles by the time that the the lord jesus came on the scene and they had been for for so long and yet it was those gentiles who finally heard about the lord jesus and that there for them was a solution to their problem and that that's what the woman has done isn't it verse 27 when she heard about jesus she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment for she said if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now, there's a whole, whole number of points just there in, in those few words, brothers and sisters. Um, first of all, do you notice what it was that brought her to Jesus? Her quest for, for recovery of her health was because she had heard about him and she believed the things which she had heard. That's that's exactly how the gospel comes to you and me, isn't it? It's like Paul says in Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to hear the message first. We hear about Jesus. And when we hear, we believe. Or um, thinking again, particularly about uh, Gentiles, um, the words of Jesus to Thomas after the resurrection. He says to Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And of course, he's thinking of, of particularly of Gentiles like like you and me, never seen the Lord Jesus and yet have heard of him and believed, which is exactly what the woman does. And it's that which brings her to find Jesus. How does she come to Jesus? Did you notice that? She says, uh, verse 27, she came behind him in the crowd. And that seems really appropriate, doesn't it, as a, as a description of Gentiles again, Gentiles who, who came from behind, behind the Jews who first had access to the, the saving message of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring them salvation. But the Gentiles came from behind and reached the Lord nevertheless, actually, despite the efforts of, of many Jews to, to keep them away. And, and perhaps thirdly, the way that she approaches Jesus in that we can appreciate, can't we, her her reluctance to approach Jesus publicly, to come and stand in, in front of him because she was unclean. The, the, the crowd, knowing of her illness, would have shunned her. They, they would have in all likelihood chased her away from, from their presence. This woman, she couldn't come and, and, and find Jesus when he was preaching in the synagogue because she was unclean. She, she wasn't allowed in there. And again, when you think of her situation there uh, and, and, and her not able to come publicly to the Lord Jesus, again, it's typical, isn't it, of, of the Gentiles at that time who, uh, who, who were, were, were pushed uh, away. Um, they, they, they would have not been able to, uh, to get to the Lord Jesus because of their their uncleanness in, in the sight of, of the Jewish nation. But she makes it nevertheless. And, uh, and verse 29 tells us that when she touched his garments, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Now, we can all relate to that, I think, brothers and sisters, can't we? That, that sense of of deep relief that every one of us felt at our baptisms. Actually, not just at our baptisms, I guess many times since, brothers and sisters, when, when we have experienced the forgiveness of our sins and know in ourselves that those sins have, have washed away. But, but that wasn't the end of the incident, was it? The woman doesn't just disappear off the scene, uh, made better uh, without even the Lord knowing and the people around her. Oh, no. Uh, verse 30 
goes on to say, doesn't it, that Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. It, it seems, doesn't it, on, on face value to be a really irrational thing that the Lord Jesus does there to to say, you know, who's who's touched me? Um, not not just because of, of what the disciples say, you know, the crowd is, is thronging around you. But because it seems that Jesus actually did know. Did you notice that in verse 32? He looked around to see her who had done this thing. Doesn't say Jesus looked around to see who had done this thing. He already knew that it was a woman that, that had touched him. You see, Jesus didn't need to, to ask him for her to, to come and, and, uh, and confess. Jesus already knew. That's, that's why, in, in a sense, it seems irrational, doesn't it? In fact, it may even seem a, a bit harsh for the Lord Jesus to ask for this, this woman to come forward because, uh, you know, the, he, he, here's him prompting her to, to make a confession of, of, of what she's done and why. And, and she's going to have to tell people there uh, what was wrong with her. And yet the reality, of course, is that what Jesus is trying to do here is, is to bring this woman out of the crowd so that she can make a confession of her faith. A faith, of course, which was far greater than many of those uh, in the crowd. It's, it's just like you and I, isn't it? How we make a, a public confession of our faith when, when we are baptised. And, and it was that confession that she then made before the Lord Jesus that allowed him to confirm that she had been healed, not just of her illness, but also of the thing that she needed even more of her sin. Look at verse 34. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And, and I guess uh, many of you know, know already that, uh, that uh, when Jesus uses those words, your faith has made you well. Actually, that those words can just as equally be read. Your faith has saved you. It, it's a, a blessing not just of healing, is it, but of forgiveness as well. Just just a, a couple of last points then from this this uh, this rude interruption to the uh, to the, the the story that we were reading through. But, but such a valuable one, isn't it? What does Jesus call the woman there in, in verse 34? He refers to her as daughter, daughter, your faith has made you well. And, and if you think of the woman as being a symbol of the Gentiles, well, that's so appropriate again, isn't it? Because when you and I, as, as Gentiles, put on Christ, then we become sons and daughters of the living God, don't we? Not only that, but we become sons and daughters of Abraham as well, and, and heirs according to the promises, as Paul says in, in Galatians 3. J Jesus chooses his words so carefully, doesn't he? Because he's, he's not just doing something on the spot. He's also, uh, he's also teaching a much greater lesson, if we can just see the, 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 the parable that's sitting there behind the incident. And, uh, and the final point in this is, is to think about what, what was it the woman did to be healed? Uh, Luke records that she came from behind and touched the border of his garment. It's not very well illustrated in the picture on screen, unfortunately, but you'll, you'll remember, won't you, that, uh, that the border of the garment was the bit which was supposed to be blue. Uh, as Numbers 15 uh, tells us, uh, Moses says from God, speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. So this woman then on that day, 
she she touched that that part of the garment which related to people remembering the commandments of the Lord and doing them. And again, so appropriate, isn't it? Because actually the only person on earth who fully remembered the commandments of the Lord and did them was the very man whose garments she touched the border of then, that the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's a little bit more to it than that even, because uh, because that 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 term there, the the corner of the garment uh, that Numbers speaks about, it's the Hebrew word kanaf, and it's uh, it's also translated not just as border or corner. It's translated in the Old Testament as wing. Well, I guess you may know where I'm going to go to now because one of the other places where it's translated as wing rather than border or corner is right at the end of our Old Testament where Malachi says, to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Just think about that. Isn't that exactly what we've just seen happening here in Mark? That this woman in Capernaum has, has come and she's, she's touched the wings, the border of the garment of the son of righteousness. And it has provided for her the healing that she needed, not just healing from her illness, but salvation from sin as well. And, and, and what is it that brings that about? It's her faith. It's because she fears God's name. She's heard of the Lord Jesus and what he's done and believing she's come to him and has been saved. And through that, she has become a true daughter of Abraham. So you see, brothers and sisters, you know, we haven't even had to get to the house of Jairus, have we, to, to see the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've already seen the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And it was there right in the middle of that crowd for all to see if only they had the eye of faith, which that woman herself has demonstrated. Well, that was the uh, that was the diversion. And, it, and it's a good one, isn't it? You can see why the gospel writers uh, recorded this when we were really reading about Jairus and his situation. So we're going to get back to, uh, to Jairus now. And verse uh, verse 34, then in Mark. Uh, he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And uh, do you notice that there's the link again, isn't there? A, a daughter has been born. Daughter, your faith has made you well. And at the same time as that daughter is being has been born anew, uh, the daughter of Jairus dies. It, it's prompting us, isn't it, to see the connection and make a connection between the two. So if if the woman then who had come to Jesus uh, with her, her uncleanness that she's been made well from, if she represents the Gentiles coming to the Lord Jesus to be saved, then surely we should look at the little girl that the daughter of the synagogue ruler, and we should see in her a representation of, of the Jews. Remember, remember that that 12 year connection that we, we saw at the beginning, brothers and sisters, that when the when that girl was born at that time, the woman became unclean. And if you think about it, essentially, that's that's what happened on a national scale, isn't it? That um, that, that when God chose Israel and Israel became his special people, by default, then all other nations, every Gentile people on earth were, were rendered not special people to, to God. They, they became rendered as unclean. And yet uh, and yet now, when the Lord Jesus appears, the son of righteousness, and, and when, when the Gentiles finally see that here is a way, like the woman sees, a way for them to be made clean of, of their, their, their sickness, that, that Jesus is the only solution 
for their illness. At that time, when Gentiles come to Jesus to be saved, actually the, the daughter of the house is, is sickening and, and dying. Those, those two things are happening alongside each other, aren't they? That as the Gentiles come into a relationship with God, the, Gentile, the, the Jews themselves actually are, are falling out of that situation sickening and dying it's actually something that the apostle paul writes about isn't it um when when he writes to his letter to the romans uh, just pick up some of these these points he makes in romans 11 talking about the difference between jew and gentile he says i say then have they the jews stumbled that they should fall certainly not but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy salvation has come to the gentiles now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And later on, he goes on to say, for if they're being cast away is the reconciling of the world. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And, and Paul sort of wraps up this particular argument uh, uh, by saying in verse 25 of Romans 11, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. You see, th there's the point that Paul is making that the, the fall of Israel had actually resulted in salvation being brought to the Gentiles. And, and yet, as you see there, Paul could see a time uh, coming country when when actually that fullness of the Gentiles would have come in and Israel would be accepted back again that they would have invited the Lord Jesus into their houses in into their lives at last and the result of that well he said there in verse 15 what will their acceptance be but life from the dead and that's what we're going to see here is isn't it in this in this chapter in in the figurative parable that's been put before us here in the story of Jairus daughter and and this woman so let's get back in there to verse 37 and, and think to to one of the original questions I asked right back at the beginning verse 37 Jesus permitted no one to follow him except Peter James and John the brother of James and we we ask don't we well why why those three men I've left this right to the end, brothers and sisters, because because, you know, I don't think there's a there's an easy answer to it. Um, some have suggested that it's because Jesus knew that, that these three men, they were going to be the most influential later on. You know, these are the men who who wrote letters, who, who very much seem to have led the early church. Was it because of that that Jesus gave them special closeness and and access to things that, that others wouldn't see? Perhaps. Uh, another commentator has suggested that actually it was because these these were the three men who had the roughest edges to smooth off. You know, Peter, uh, mouth before brain uh, or, or James and John, the, the, the sons of thunder, you know, that Jesus couldn't actually trust them to be left on their own without him. So he kept them even closer to him. I think that one's slightly, uh, slightly less likely, but it, it's a possibility, isn't it? In fact, we're not actually told. So we don't know for sure. What we can say, though, is this, there are practical reasons why Jesus took them in. For a start, Jesus would have to leave some of the apostles outside just to control the crowd. Uh, because remember, the, the crowd had gone with him. They would have all thronged into the house if there weren't apostles outside holding them back physically. And uh, as another practical thing, it probably wasn't possible to bring all 12 of them into the house either. So Jesus had to pick just a few to bring with him. But actually, from a scriptural point of view, it was the right thing to do. Because remember, in the scriptures, wherever, where, where witnesses are sought to provide evidence, reliable evidence of any event that had taken place, scripture said you needed two or three witnesses to establish a matter, didn't it? And that's what Jesus does then. He brings three witnesses with him so that then they can be a reliable uh, source of evidence when it's needed, which it was going to be, because in the years to come, these were the men who would have to witness all three of them to that event so that it could be written down for our understanding today in, in our New Testament. These three men then are the witnesses to the majesty 
of Jesus and they are going to witness his majesty as the man who could give life to the dead just as a just as he says himself in John's gospel as the father raises the dead and gives life to them even so the son gives life to whom he will well poor Jairus in in all these things that have been going on remember Remember Jairus, he, he'd come to Jesus begging him, saying back in verse 23, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. You know, Jairus had faith in Jesus when he came to the Lord Jesus. But now his faith is going to be tested even further. Can you just come finally with me, please, over to Luke's gospel record of it, Luke chapter eight. And let's see what we read in uh, in Luke chapter eight, it's towards the end of the chapter, and uh, we'll pick it up at verse forty nine. Verse forty nine of Luke chapter eight. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, "Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher." But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. I just want you to notice the comment that that Jesus uh, Jesus makes there. She will be made well. Jesus doesn't say believe and she will be raised from the dead. You see, to Jesus, the girl isn't dead, is she? She, she's only asleep. She only needs to, to be made better, which, of course, Jesus confirms again, doesn't he? In, in, in the, uh, the words of verse 52, you know, all wept and mourned for her. But he said, do not weep. She's not dead, but sleeping. And it, it's in those few words, brothers and sisters, that the Lord Jesus makes to Jairus, that Jesus is trying to give Jairus the, the boost that he needs to his faith. That, that if he could just trust Jesus, then actually what he'd asked for at the beginning, which was that she would be made well, that would absolutely be the case. But it was it was asking an extra step, wasn't it, from Jairus? He had believed. Now Jesus wants him to build on that and believe even more. I think that's a test that we all face at times in our lives, brothers and sisters, you know that God, God sometimes puts you and me through a level of testing. And, and when we think we can maybe just cope with that, he then brings an additional level of testing upon us. Now, now, God doesn't do that because we don't have faith, does he? Just as is the case here. Jairus had faith. And, and when God brings an extra level of testing into our lives, it's not because our faith is lacking necessarily. It's because God wants to strengthen it even more because that will be to our future benefit. And that's what he's doing here. The, 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 the question is whether whether we can accept that as Jairus has to and, and put our extra level of trust in our heavenly father. You know, that quiet trust that we are asked to have when faced with those kind of trials. It's a world away, isn't it, from the sort of society that Jesus lived in. All those people, verse 52, who who all wept and, and mourned for her. And uh, and yet when Jesus said she's only sleeping, verse 53, they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. You know, that the shallowness of those people there who could go from, from crying and, and mourning at one minute to, to, to ridiculing Jesus the next minute. Well, it's, it's not that far different from our own society, is it, brothers and sisters? You know, we, we live in a society where so many men and women ridicule our belief in God, our trust in the Lord Jesus. They, they mock us for believing in the resurrection and the kingdom of God. And yet very many of the very same people We'll, we'll go to funerals and, and talk about the, the departed looking down from heaven because they, they want to hold on to something. It's, it's such a shallow society, isn't it, where, uh, where people have such a, a lack of faith. And that, 
that lack of faith had no no place to witness the glory of Christ, which is, is going to be re- revealed to us now. And again, like, like we saw with uh, with the resurrection of Lazarus, the, the glory of the Lord Jesus, his majesty is now going to be displayed to us, not not in brightness, not in cloud, not not with a, a voice from heaven, as, as, as Johnny's going to talk about next, but uh, but rather, well, actually very similar to the resurrection of Lazarus. It's going to happen with just three words spoken, isn't it? And this time with a simple handhold. Let's pick it up. Verse 54. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand and called, saying, little girl, arise. Well, that's that's no different to what you and I might do today if we were trying to, uh, to gently wake a, a child from sleep, is it? We, we might just hold a hand and say a few quiet words to, to wake them up. And yet those those quiet actions of the Lord Jesus were enough to raise the dead from sleep. You know, I'm, I'm sure that the Apostle Peter had had that that few moments absolutely branded into his memory. And, and it must have sprung back to mind when when a few years later he was faced himself with, with a very similar situation. Just think forward to, uh, to Acts 9, just a few years later where he's there at the, the bedside of Dorcas. And, and look at how Acts records it. Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. Uh, remember, Jesus had said, Talitha, kumai. So similar, the words. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It's worth you uh, going away and just thinking about why it is that Jesus holds the girl's hand to raise her from the dead, whereas Peter doesn't hold Tabitha's hand until he's raised her from the dead. There's maybe maybe something in that to think about. But uh, but what what a. What a, a duplication of the event there. And it's deliberately written in that way, isn't it, between um, between Luke's account and, and the Acts record to, to, to bring those two uh, events together in our mind. And you can see, can't you, that this event in Jairus's house that day would cement in the minds of, of those three apostles who witnessed it. This this essential teaching, which is right at the core of the of the gospel message and of our faith that for God's children, death is no more than a sleep. It's something that was hinted at uh, in the Old Testament, wasn't it? You know, there are times when the Old Testament tries to put over that to us. You think of uh, Daniel 12, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. But it's it's only a hint, isn't it, in in prophecy and, uh, and the very few resurrections that are there. Whereas when we get to the New Testament, that that message that death is no more than a sleep is their center stage because it's there in the things that the Lord Jesus does that these apostles witness. And it's there in the Lord Jesus himself when his father raises him from the dead. And and it goes through the New Testament from then onwards, doesn't it? Like the Apostle Paul when he writes to the Thessalonians about those who've died, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. And that's the message always being reinforced to us then, that, uh, that we need not fear the grave because it is now for for you and for me, it's no more than a sleep. Well, we, we round off with the uh, the closing words of Luke eight, where um, verse fifty six, it says her parents were astonished. I guess that's the understatement of the chapter, isn't it? But he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Now, whether or not Jairus and his wife uh, kept stum about this amazing event in their house, we don't know. 
but what we do know, brothers and sisters, is because there were witnesses. Those three men, Peter, James and John, were there to witness those astounding events. Then you and I today are able to read about them all over again. Like the woman, we are able to hear and believe so that we can come to Jesus and receive both cleansing and we can also ourselves now live in hope of being woken from sleep.